National Television Network. Coming up on Court to Court. And our experience in law in the Jones versus Free case brought all resistance to change. And this is a, a significant institutional change. It's a cultural change. Communication is the most important aspect of a capital case for an execution. This is Court to Court, your connection to what's happening in the federal courts around the country. Providing information and ideas that will enhance your job and how the courts function. Now with today's program, Michael Burney. Welcome to Court to Court. This is the third edition of this educational magazine program from the Federal Judicial Center. On today's program, we'll learn how several courts manage some high-profile cases, hear lawyers' reactions to electronic case filing, understand what two legal terms really mean, get an update on managing capital cases, and we'll hear from your court colleagues. When it comes to scrutiny of our government, more often than not, public attention is focused on the executive and legislative branches. Occasionally, though, when a case of great notoriety reaches the courts, that intense spotlight is turned on the judiciary, most often on an individual court, and sometimes it's quite unexpected. Regardless of the court's location, type, or size, the message of our first segment is anticipate and prepare. Justice Department investigators believe they have enough evidence against Theodore Kaczynski, so much so they've begun to think about where to hold the trial. I was very shocked to see vans and trucks and hundreds of people out there, and I was like, oh my goodness, this is going to be a, something really different. We thought that there would be a Discount the life of 
lesson is that the system works. It works very, very well. So you can see there's a network of court colleagues ready and willing to assist you if you're confronted with a high-profile case. Another excellent resource is this book, The Manual for Managing Notorious Cases, published by the National Center for State Courts. On a different topic, the Center is making available a 40-hour self-study course for supervisors. Foundations of Management was originally developed by the National Study Center. Case scenarios and exercises have been adapted to reflect the work of federal court supervisors and managers. For more information, please call 202-502-4122. A separate course is available for probation and pretrial services managers. To request that version, call 202-502-4114. court to court program, we brought you information about how two courts are making the transition to electronic case filing. One response to that segment, which we reported on in our second program, suggested that we look at how ECF affects the bar. Today, we'll see that involving the bar is one key to making the transition to ECF. Felix Garcia is a New York attorney who handles many bankruptcy cases. He was wary of electronic case filing at first. I was a little worried about um, this new type of filing because it was not familiar to me. We're all humans, and we're all resistant to change. And this is a, a significant institutional change. It's a cultural change. In 1996, the District Court for the Northern District of Ohio mandated that all pleadings in the specialized maritime asbestos litigation be filed electronically. Through the Internet, the court has received more than 165,000 pleadings for 16,000 cases. I would say that the greatest impediment to the bar's utilization of electronic case filing is their lack of familiarity and understanding of the system. Because of not knowing how to, uh, not knowing much about this new type of filing, I, 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 I hesitate. Garcia overcame his hesitation with the help of the staff from the Southern District of New York Bankruptcy Court. When the Chapter 7 um, filers came along and realized that they actually were saving the, the money, either time or money, by doing it in their firms, they became avid fans of the system. It gives me flexibility. I am able to uh, file these petitions uh, at, at, at any time. I don't have to uh, commit myself to filing during business hours or during the hours that the court is open. Garcia's use has grown dramatically. I, I'd say about, about 50% of my, my 
chapter 7 petitions uh, in this uh, vignette. And that's what I think is consistent. The larger firms working with Morris's clerk's office are also enthusiastic. We saw that as uh, an opportunity to move forward on something that we perceived, and I think correctly, uh, would be uh, the wave of the future. But the future means a cultural change. That increased speed and convenience only goes so far in getting the bar to use ECF. We can encourage and, if necessary, cajole the attorneys into agreeing to uh, put the case uh, into the electronic file. However, uh, it ultimately it has to depend to a great extent on the willingness of the attorneys to go along with it. And how does one get attorneys to go along with it? I came to trust the system uh, simply through using it during the course of several months uh, and just, just putting it through its paces, filing different documents, seeing if it worked. I think that the encouragement from the court, particularly the judges, is probably the most significant factor in getting attorneys and firms uh, comfortable um, in, uh, with using the new electronic filing system. We involved the bar from the very beginning in the electronic case filing project. We set up a committee of uh, attorneys to help us draft rules and to draft procedures for electronic case filing. And I think that went a long way toward uh, making the bar feel that the rules that they had come up with were practical rules. I think the rules committee uh, was very successful. Uh, some of the key issues that were uh, discussed were issues such as of the bar to agree to ECF is one thing. Getting them to use it is another. Any project that actually changes the way someone comes to you, uses a system, takes a lot of time and effort in training. We got terrific training from the court. The on-the-ground training in the law firm is probably the most important because it gets the attorneys comfortable uh, with the system. Younger attorneys are automatically comfortable system because they grow up utilizing computers. Good morning, my name is Evelyn Rodriguez and this is my colleague Daryl McFadden and we'd like to welcome you to the Bankruptcy Court and familiarize you with the electronic case filing system. I think that maybe extra time needs to be spent with uh, those of us who have practiced longer and are more used to the paper society and are frightened by uh, pressing a button on a computer to affect legal consequence. Now I'd like to turn over the person. Overcoming those fears often means one-on-one -on -one attention, which can become a resource issue for a court. Currently, the way things work in the intake office, and as they have for years in the courts, are that the attorneys come into court, uh, into the clerk's office, and this ECF training reverses that, and we actually go out to the attorneys to train them on their machines with electronic case filing. They, the attorneys, are using their computers, and therefore, it was our conclusion that that's what we need to train them on with their computers. That hands-on attention, though, is really important. That's very difficult to give. It's very labor-intensive for the court. It does take more time. It takes more time, and it is definitely more strain on the clerk's office having an employee out doing this. Payoff is in the reduction in the amount of paper, the reduction in the phone calls we get, in uh, needing documents immediately. And we hope within this year the reduction in even the technical needs that they experience will be diminished. Right now, in my firm, Cleveland office, I would say that approximately 10% of the litigators are involved in cases in the electronic filing system, and I expect that that number will probably increase uh, to well over 70% uh, of the litigators in the next five years. So it's a matter of never being discouraged, always, uh, always marketing it, whether it's internally or with the bar, and getting out there. It's getting out there and 
sitting down with folks one on one or a group environment to demonstrate the system and uh, make ourselves available whenever and however we can. Still ahead on the Ford Report, we'll hear about dealing with death penalty execution cases, learn what jurisdiction and habeas really mean, and find out what you say about the program. Now, watch this. Please fill in the evaluation form available in your program materials or online on the JNET. Be sure to watch Perspectives, a magazine program with the Asian Open Class Services, where it deals on national issues affecting the system, as well as reports on the international field, on location stories to highlight innovative practices in districts large and small. You'll get the legal perspective from the English speaking there and the latest updates. received many requests to help understand two words that are used every day in the courts, jurisdiction and habeas. Here with these words to know is my colleague, Bob Fagan. How many times have you heard the phrase, do we have jurisdiction in this case? Do you ever wonder what jurisdiction really means? Jurisdiction is simply the authority and power of a court to hear and decide a case. To better understand this concept, let's talk first about the differences between state and federal jurisdiction. State courts are considered courts of general jurisdiction. Their authority extends to civil disputes, criminal prosecutions, divorce and family issues, and probate. Federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction. Their authority to decide a case arises from a specific federal statute or from a provision of the U.S. Constitution. Most cases come into the federal courts because they involve disputes between citizens of different states or because they involve violation of federal law. But wait, there's more. In both state and federal courts, jurisdiction is also divided into original and appellate. Original jurisdiction means a court has the power to hear a case for the first time. Trials are held in courts with original jurisdiction. These would be the lower courts of the federal system. Appellate jurisdiction refers to the power of an appeals court to review decisions of lower courts and either let stand those decisions or overturn them. In the federal system, the appellate courts are the 13 circuit courts of appeal and the Supreme Court. The important point to remember is that any court may decide a case only when it has the authority or the jurisdiction to do so. Now let's consider habeas. You'll most often hear this term used in the phrase, a writ of habeas corpus, which sometimes is shortened to simply habeas. Habeas corpus is Latin, meaning to have the body. A petition for a writ of habeas corpus is filed in court with the intent to obtain the release of someone wrongfully imprisoned. Habeas proceedings allege that a conviction violates the defendant's constitutional or statutory rights, or that the sentence imposed violates those rights. A petition for a writ of habeas corpus is filed in a case only after all trials are concluded and all appeals denied. The court in which the petition is filed must then decide whether there has been a violation of the defendant's rights. If the petition is denied, the defendant can file it in the next higher court, including ultimately the U.S. Supreme Court. The most dramatic use of habeas is in death penalty cases. Congress recently has placed stringent restrictions on when and how frequently someone may use habeas petitions. We'll hear more about this in our next segment. And we'll be back in our next program with more Words to Know.
Cox said, Congress has enacted legislation that affects habeas corpus petitions. The anti-terrorism and effective death penalty law limits defendants to filing only one federal habeas petition, except in unusual circumstances, and it must be filed within one year of the date judgment becomes final. As the frequency of death penalty case executions increases, the likelihood that a court will handle last-minute filings also increases. The courts are dealing with people's lives, and we all want to ensure that requests by the petitioners are processed as quickly as possible. We covered a recent presentation to appellate clerks and chief deputies by Cynthia Rapp, staff attorney at the U.S. Supreme Court, who manages all death penalty filings at the court. Um, as far as determining which cases are emergencies and not, you have in front of you a two-page um, death list. This is something that I do every week. It comes out every Monday. It normally will list the uh, upcoming executions for the next month. The number of death penalty case executions is rising. Last year, there were 68 executions. Through the middle of May this year, there have been 44. This year, 1999, will probably go over 100. And I think that means that a lot of courts that may not have seen executions are going to see them. So if they don't have procedures in place now, they need to put them in place. The anti-terrorism and effective death penalty law, often referred to as ADEPA, means district and appellate courts need a way to track the one-year limit on filing habeas petitions. Because the statute is it's not jurisdictional, it's been deemed to be um, equitable. So there are maybe an instance where the one year has actually expired, but the, the petition would still be accepted because there was some type of equitable tolling. Uh, perhaps the person didn't have an attorney, or there, there may be other factors involved. The law affects successive petitions, too. Because what people may do is they will come to the U.S. District Court with their habeas petition and attempt to file it. And it may be a successive petition, but they may not tell the District Court that it is. So the District Court needs to have a tracking system where they can look up to see whether or not this person has ever filed a habeas petition before. Under the ADEPA law, defendants must request permission from an appellate court to file a successive habeas petition. So the appellate court is going to get a request for authorization to file a successive petition without having any decision from the district court below. Um, so they're going to be seeing these in the first instance. For all court staff, the keys to managing death penalty cases are communication and a plan of action. Team down, you're better apt to be able to handle it in a professional manner than kind of losing your cool because you you know don't know who to call and you don't know how to get information. If you deal with the same person over and over again and you have good rapport, which I do with most all of the circuit courts, it's, it's very easy to get information. We are in constant communication with the district courts as well as the state courts in the state of execution in the two to three weeks prior to the execution date so that all of the courts know what is going on. And we in turn call the Supreme Court and let them know that potentially they're going to be involved. The, the biggest thing up front would be to make sure your judges are aware of when there are upcoming executions. You want to make sure you know how to get in touch with your judge or judges because they're going to be required sometimes to vote at the last moment. During the seminar, Rapp described trying to reach justices in the evening. The justices normally are not in the building, which causes a problem, obviously, as you are aware of, is trying to track them all down and get them to vote. They tend not to want to carry cell phones or beepers with them or not be disturbed. Um, it, it can be understandable now, given the volume of cases we're getting 10 a month. Shoemaker's advice for court staff? Find out who is handling the case in district court. Communicate with your judges about important information. Communicate with your own staff so that they're kept up to date. I got some more info for you on the new death penalty procedures. Most courts designate one person to deal with death penalty cases. I think whoever it is needs to be someone who does it all the time so that that person does become familiar with the other people that they deal with and has procedures down. And Shoemaker says, have a backup plan. Even if something came up that I was not in the office or the clerk wasn't in the office, other people would be made aware of the situation so nothing would fall through. Another issue is compliance with rules. Are you in the clerk's office going to say, I'm sorry, this does not comply with our rules. Please redo this and resubmit it. Uh, you know, I don't think so. But, you know, the hour before the execution, I am not going to be the one to not accept something. If the justices don't want it, fine. They can tell me that, but not me. Our court does not allow filing by fax. 
accept a death penalty cases. When we get down to the wire with an execution set, we let counsel file faxes, and in fact, we spend a lot of time scanning at fax machines waiting for papers to come through. Ethics are another aspect of dealing with these cases. How much detail the other side? I mean, it's to our benefit if both sides know what's going on, because then we can get things in quicker, and that usually is what our goal is, is to get all the papers in, get them off to our judges so that they can make their decisions. And that's a fine line. What do you tell them? If the state calls you and says, have you heard anything? Do you know what's going on? I normally won't tell them. I may say, I've talked to them, and I think they're going to file something. I won't obviously tell them what the issues are at that point. The defense attorney is afraid, well, I'm going to tell her that this is what I'm doing, and she's just going to go ahead and tell the state AG. Well, I won't. And especially if they've told me not to, I will not. As so frequently is the case, court colleagues are one of the best sources of help. So I would suggest getting in touch with a circuit or in this district court that already is doing this and find out what it is that they're doing, what's working, what's not, before you try to, to reinvent the wheel. Rapp also advises court staff to plan for the emotions of handling these cases. I think we need to keep in mind it is something that is stressful, and I think what's helped me a lot is being able to talk about it with other people in the other courts who do this all the time. Because sometimes it does become so routine, and then all of a sudden you think about what it is that you're working on, and you realize it shouldn't be routine those things to people who understand. On April 12th, Chief Justice William Rehnquist announced that the Federal Judicial Center's board selected District Judge Fern Smith of San Francisco as the new director of the Federal Judicial Center. Judge Smith succeeds Judge Rhea Zobel, who in July will return to the U.S. District Court in Massachusetts after four years as director. Since 1996, Judge Smith has served as chair of the Judicial Conference Advisory Committee under the Rules of Evidence. She has been a district judge in California since 1988 and has written and spoken extensively on evidentiary matters, trial practice, and other topics. And now, it's your turn. This is the part of the program in which we ask you your views and thoughts. Since our last program, we heard from Kathy Gould Feldman, Chief Deputy Clerk of the Bankruptcy Court of the Southern District of Florida. She writes, After watching Court to Court, many of our staff told me they really benefited from seeing the different situations facing other courts and how they handle them. They like seeing real deputy clerks and how they interact. This program helps us understand that all court units face the same issues and we can learn from each other. We're glad to know we facilitate that exchange of information. It's a point which Patrick Fisher, Clerk of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals in Denver, also made about court to court. It is the best request we get that I've seen from travel based learning uh, because we hear what the advantage of travel based is not being there. It's being in the hallway, it's being at lunch, it's being at dinner, talking to people from other courts about how they do things, and hearing what other people have to say. On our previous program's evaluation forms, several of your colleagues commented that they'd like to have more information in each segment. Typical was Kathleen Johnson's comment from the District of Utah. She said, the information given was too general. Maybe too many topics were covered in a short time frame. Possibly cover one area in more depth. As you may have noticed in today's program, we responded to these concerns and have included fewer but longer segments. Your reaction and evaluation of what we've covered and how we're doing it will help us bring you the information you want. Finally, we received this comment from Chief Judge Carl Mattia of the District Court of the Northern District of Ohio. One of the things that uh, some of the staff have indicated is that it, uh, it really uh, helps them feel as though they are part of the uh, important team because um, by providing training to them in this fashion, it indicates to them that, that we value their services and that we want them to improve their uh, techniques. Thank you to everyone who's commented about Court to Court. We want to hear from you, because we want you to have a voice in this program. Here's the JNet address you can use to send us your comments. Click on Court to Court, and then select Online Evaluation. We encourage you to give us an evaluation of today's program, which you can do online, or you can fill out an evaluation at your site and mail or fax it to us. Our fax
fax number is 202-502-4088. Be sure to check the FJTN bulletin or the FJC website for the air date of the next edition of Perspectives on Probation and Pretrial Services. And we'll be back in October with a look at putting strategic planning to work in your court unit. That's Court to Court for today. On behalf of our staff here at the Federal Judicial Center, I'm Michael Burnham. Thank you for watching.